Okay, good morning, everybody. Bill Lester here with Hernando County Extension. Uh, welcome to this morning's virtual plant clinic. And just in time, today just we have time. our regular co-host, mm -hmm. Lily Brownie, joining us. Who yes, just I just, I, just in time. I swooped on in here just in time. You know, I that's, how out, I, I, that's how I do a lot of my classes and attend meetings and stuff. I come... <laughs> running in the door, run up the computer, go ahead and get started and log on like one minute before or one minute late. So yeah. Yep. I was out getting my second vaccination. So well, congratulations. That's great. <laughs> Beautiful day for it too. Yeah. I I'm sure the um the uh health department workers were very happy for a cool morning because th they're doing a great job out there. They really are run smooth, everything is great. So yeah, this would have been a beautiful morning to be outside doing something, even if it's in a parking lot with a mask on and giving people shots. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I you don't want me giving you a shot, but I'm sure that they do a fine job. They're much better. They do a great job and it's very well organized. And um, I have to go sit in the half hour line, but even that, you know, ran fine. And so and, and so that means by um, May 3rd, guess what that means? I'll be back um, operating out of my work office at the office full time. So. Well, our office has been open and is currently open. And I have been here a couple days a week and beginning, starting the beginning of May, we'll be here even more per week. So okay. definitely, if you have a question, well, for anybody watching, if you have any questions, go ahead and just go ahead and post them in right now and we'll talk about them. But in general, if you have a question that you'd like either somebody at the extension office to answer or Lily, email is by far the best way to get in touch with me. You can contact us through our Facebook pages. And, you know, we get a lot of questions that way. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. people IMing us or emailing us directly on Facebook. So you can contact us that way. You yeah. can call the office or you could just join in with a virtual plant clinic here and ask your question. Cause that's kind of what it's designed for. Yep. Yeah. There's Betty. And good morning, buddy. Mm -hmm. How are you doing? Glad to see that you're here with us. Today. I bet it's really pretty chilly in Tallahassee. It was um, 55 here when I went out this morning. It quickly went up to 60, but up here at my house, it was 55, which to me, to well, it's a, it's a graduated thing. I got a text from my daughter in Pennsylvania yesterday saying that it is snowing. <laughs> so um, snowing up north makes for beautiful Aprils. <laughs> <laughs> down here because it's not too hot so um it was nice and uh, you know sweater weather <laughs> this yeah. morning and i think each day that we are not a thousand degrees is a gift <laughs> as we get closer into the hotter season 50 degrees in tallahassee no snow or rain that's <laughs> good i think florida was the only um one out of 50 states that did not have any amount of snow this past winter. I read that. Well, and to answer your question. Here, I hope that we didn't get any snow yeah. here in Hernando County. And they quickly answered your question. The mountain peaks of Hawaii get snow. <laughs> so. Well, there are no mountain peaks of Hernando County, so uh, we're yep. exempt there today. And oh, well, it's about the same. Wisconsin. Oh, my gosh. We've got people from all over the place here. Yeah, but it's, we have about the same weather, too. 73 and in Broward. That with 73 in Broward County. That's beautiful. <laughs> but in Wisconsin, oh, they had an inch of snow. Yes. I know Western Pennsylvania had some snow because, I, like I said, I heard some complaints about it. <laughs> Yeah, I know that uh, up north in a lot of states is still snowing. Spring is just, you know, arriving right now. Here in Central Florida, though, I've got a funny feeling that spring is just about to wrap up. And yes. any day now, all of a sudden it's going to get hot and stay hot. 
you know, to expect this beautiful weather, this uh, kind of temperate weather in Florida in May is expecting too much. Oh, definitely. By May, we're yeah. heading into summer. Keep in mind by anywhere from June 1st to June 15th, I generally say by June 15th, we're done with the warm season vegetable crops. And after June 15th, you need to be growing either something tropical. And there are choices like okra, sweet potatoes, boniato. Uh, there's a number of other kind of oddball tropical vegetables that you could experiment with and try growing. I haven't even but, heard of that one. What is boniato? It is, it's a root crop. It's sim very similar to sweet potato, but it's very popular in Cuban cuisine and native to Central America. Yeah. So think just kind of a different type of um, yam or potato. something. And there's cassava, which mm -hmm. is a tropical crop that you, it's also a root crop. Uh, cassava. Seems like a lot of the tropical crops are root crops. Is that because it's cooler in the ground? Not necessarily because they all have an above ground component that deals yeah. with the heat and humidity and rain just fine. Um, they're very convenient for people, especially in poor countries, because they're similar to bananas and plantains. Very, very starchy. Lots of yes, carbohydrates. Yes. Well, of course. Yeah, that's what it is. It's to provide the energy for the plant. Yep. Yeah. So all these root crops are very, very starchy roots. Now, if you eat too many of them, if you're eating it way too often, you know, it's just going to not be really good for your diet or mine. <laughs> kind of like eating French fries three times a day, not really good for your diet. That's a root crop. Yes, it is. <laughs> Maybe you could do a class on that. I would just You just inspired me. I have a title for you. Underground Gardening. <laughs> Sounds cryptic. I'm writing that down. I like that. <laughs> Because there are a lot of root crops that you can grow here. If you ever go to um, really any grocery store, but especially if it's an ethnic grocery store, I know near us we have two different um, Hispanic grocery stores. You'll go in and you'll find yuca and boniato, and there's a couple of other ones that are different, you know, great big mm -hmm. pumpy roots. And you might look at it and go like, well, what the heck do I do with that? Just look it up online. You're going right. to find right. some recipes. Give it a try. Either you like it or you hate it. Mm -hmm. I love yeah. um, yuca. I like ordering that at um, uh, Spanish restaurants. Mm -hmm. And there's um, somebody correct me if we have any uh, people who know about Cuban cuisine on here. But they make like a garlic oil sauce that you dump on it. So you go up with lots of garlic. Good oh. stuff. I like that. <laughs> um, I do have a question here from Magdalene about spinach. Yes. Why her spinach never grows? What can I do to help? Well, we don't know where she's calling from or yeah, where if you're writing from. What county you're from? Because that does help to narrow it down. It's, it's different in Broward County than it is up in Tallahassee. And very, very different up in uh, Wisconsin and some of the other states. <laughs> but spinach likes it and needs it when the weather is really cool. So you have to grow it during the winter here in Central Florida. Uh, wherever you live, you know, you have to grow it at a very, very cool time of year. Spinach doesn't mind it if it gets really cold. But if it gets hot or here in the winter, the temperature will kind of bounce up and down. You get a cold spell, then it bounces up to 80, then it gets you get a freeze, and it's up to 80. Spinach hates that. And a lot of times, if you try planting it and it's too warm, it won't even germinate. It won't come up. Commercial growers here have a tough time with spinach. It has to be one of those consistently chilly winters to do well. Um, what's another one that needs it cool? Cauliflower. Lettuce. Lettuce. Lettuce needs it fairly cool. Lettuce is going to get messed up if the temperatures keep bouncing. But cauliflower, you can grow beautiful cauliflower in Central Florida, but if it's a warm winter, it's not going to do well. Those high temperatures, even a little bit, 
when the cauliflower makes its head, it's going to be like the size of a quarter or a 50 cent piece. You're going to get a little tiny cauliflower and not like a big grocery store cauliflower. But keep Magdalene, it. Magdalene is in Brooksville, so she's right okay. here. Keep trying it because one of these years you're going to get lucky and you're going to plant it during a chilly winter. When should she start it? Pardon me? When should she start it? And by seed or by um, seedlings? What should she do? By seed, and I wouldn't try it any earlier than the beginning of October. Okay. So keep trying it, and if you get a cool spell, it'll germinate, it'll grow. You can grow beautiful spinach, but it's just those warm temperatures, especially when the seeds are trying to germinate, that's going to really throw things off. It's not something you want to start now, by any means. No. Nope. You really don't want to be trying or messing with any of those cool season crops now. And I see people on Facebook and they're all, oh, I want to grow lettuce. And uh, I found a heat tolerant lettuce. Okay. <laughs> it's too hot for even heat tolerant lettuce right now. Yeah. So if you're a really advanced gardener, if you have maybe a hydroponic system, you have a way to keep it cool, you can grow lettuce in a hydroponic system out of season when it's really warm. If you have a water chiller system, yeah. you have to make cold water to irrigate those roots with in a hydroponic system because if you keep the roots cold on lettuce, it'll grow okay. If the roots and the leaves get too hot, it's gonna to go to seed very quickly. So you need to be an advanced gardener to even try those kind of things. Start with the simple stuff. Start with radishes in the middle of winter. You're gonna get radishes. You can't, can't fail too badly. <laughs> You're gonna get at least a few radishes. And then you can kind of take it from there what should we start now? Right Mid now, if you're real, real fast and you do it this weekend, you can still plant beans. Everything else should already be in the ground at this point, started and in the ground. You can start those tropical things. You can put in sweet potatoes, but you can wait until June or July to do that. Sweet potatoes like it flat out really hot. Um, you can start. They're, they're an African crop, aren't they? Or are they Central American? I'm not positive. I think <laughs> they're from they're a hot place. <laughs> yeah, they're from a, they're from a hot place. So, <laughs> <laughs> okra is native to Africa, tropical Africa. Mm -hmm. So, okra will take the heat, humidity, and the rains, and any of those other oddball tropical vegetables. And we're going to have some classes on those coming up. As it gets hotter, it'll kind of make sense about June, July, and August. We're not going to be telling people to plant cucumbers and tomatoes. Wrong time of year for that. We're going to have some classes with some experts about different tropical vegetables. We do have a class coming up in May at some point. Let me pop into my calendar here. And... On May 25th, we have a class on growing calabasa. That's not kielbasa. No, that's not no, kielbasa. To grow that, you need to start with a piglet, I think. <laughs> yes. Very, very good point if you're growing kielbasa, but this is <laughs> calabasa. Do you know what that is, Lily? I've heard you say it, but no, I have no idea what it is. It's a tropical, like, winter squash. Okay. Winter squash slash pumpkin. And it's related to Seminole pumpkin, but I believe that they're a little bit different. So calabasa is grown and eaten in Central America and in the Caribbean, and it takes summer heat very well. And I'm going to have uh, Dr. Maru in teaching that. He's the University of Florida researcher and expert on it. They're looking at developing and isolating varieties that farmers can grow to grow something in the summer when there's not, they don't have a whole lot of choices to make them more profitable to supply the growing um, ethnic and Cuban and Central American market. You know, they have grocery stores and people looking for it. He's doing research to help uh, farmers meet those needs. So if he could tell farmers how to grow a bunch of it, 
he can tell the homeowner how to grow some in their backyard. I'm going to give it a try this year, I think. What do you do with it once you have some? How do you, you prepare you it? You cook it and eat it just like you would an squash. acorn squash or butternut or Hubbard. Those are all winter squashes or pumpkin. Pie pumpkins are technically winter squashes. Mm -hmm. You can bake one and eat it like you would uh, butternut or acorn squash. I do. Okay. I think it's a really good side vegetable. It's tasty. And you put all that garlic on it like you do no, the other? No, no. <laughs> lots of cinnamon and nutmeg. And oh, butter. okay. Uh, You're making a pie out of it. No, no, no. I don't add the pumpkin pie things to it, although it's very similar. Some of the seasonings you put in a pumpkin pie. Mm-hmm are the same that you would put on pumpkin if you were having it just with dinner. You know, we still need to do a cooking show here, I think. Yeah, that'd be great. Here, what about, gonna, what about arugula? Louise sent me some pictures last night, it's and I'll show them in just a moment, but let me pop up here really quick. Lee White says calabasa loves it here in Broward County. Uh, they cook it like butternut squash. Okay, great. And you can find it here. Um, they sell it at Publix. They sell it at a lot of grocery stores. And if you go to any of the um, Hispanic grocery stores, they're definitely going to have it. And they can be large. So a lot of times, calabasa, if you see it in the store, it's going to be like basketball size. Oh, my gosh, oh, what really? am I going to do with that? Yeah. Once it's you figure good. out, yeah. It's good for you. Eat more of it. So we will We'll focus. We'll be sure to highlight that on our upcoming cooking show. <laughs> In the cucurbit family, I knew that mm -hmm. when you were describing it. Yes. Yeah, I know that there's, I believe, a difference between calabasa and Seminole pumpkin, but I couldn't tell you off the top of my head what that difference is. But after we have the class on it, I'll know what it is. And if you guys tune in, you'll know also. I'm sure is there's slightly different varieties of it. And some varieties would fall under Seminole pumpkin. Other varieties would fall m under more calabasa. I'm assuming a Seminole pumpkin, though, is not native despite its name. It, I believe it is native to Florida. Oh, cool. All right. The um, Seminole Indians grow it. And um, Chasawitska means hanging pumpkins or something <laughs> does it and that I'll go, go look for some Seminole pumpkins yeah okay I'll go, I'll go out there and look for some i live yeah. like two minutes from there that's that's my playground <laughs> yeah yeah so technically yeah. you should be able to grow it in your neighborhood pretty well okay. it takes the heat well and obviously takes sandy soil well it's not going to have a lot of it's not a heavy feeder you don't have to fertilize it a lot you really don't have to use fungicides on it, which is a bonus. Yeah. So Diane is asking, when is calabasa in season to buy fresh? I believe if you grow it yourself, it's going to be ready to pick and eat in late summer. Although you can find it at grocery stores year round. Mm -hmm. So it's getting grown somewhere and coming here from somewhere. And is this similar to chayote squash? No, it is different. Calabasa is like a winter squash and chayote is like a summer squash. And that's something else that you can grow. This is a tropical vegetable and it's gonna do pretty well here. It might get a little aggressive that yeah, chayote they does. are different. But let's go back up to the question. About arugula. Yes. Louise sent me a couple of pictures, and this is going to be arugula. And she found a couple of light green dots on it. And let's go ahead. And can you see that? Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, let me go into this. And can you see the full picture okay? Yes, it's kind of small, but I can, we can see it. Okay. Well, I just took the pictures. I had to toss into PowerPoint to be able to share right. them. Right. It might be bigger on their screens, you know, because we're seeing it with all these little squares, how our screen is. Unless they're say, watching it on their phones, in which case it's pretty right. tiny. But So okay. I will describe what we're looking at here. Okay. <clears throat> here we have a leaf from an arugula plant. 
and it has tiny little light green dots on it. And what these are are insect eggs, and they're shaped like a little um, oval or elongated barrel, and they're all kind of stuck on the leaf. And she has a couple pictures here. There's a oh, better oh that's a good yeah now you see it perfectly yeah mm -hmm. they're all lined up like little soldiers there <laughs> exactly you see all these little little soldiers lined up you know kind of stuck on end stuck all over the leaf there and there's another picture of them those are obviously insect eggs so I can tell you what they're not <laughs> let me get out of here. <laughs> They are not zebras. <laughs> yes, I mean, we could. They are not. Well, first of all, they're not green lacewing eggs. Okay. If each one of those eggs was on a teeny tiny little stalk mm -hmm. or a little um, stalk, I guess would be the best. Like a string. A yeah. string, yeah. 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 If each egg was standing up on the end of a little string, that would be green lacewing eggs. And if they look little um, multi-sided like a little barrel and they're all stacked perfectly next to each other in a big group, those would be stink bug eggs. So they're not stink bug eggs. Let's see. I see somebody has the correct answer, and it is butterfly eggs. Either butterfly hey. or moth eggs would be my guess. Okay. So if you leave them and let them hatch, you're going to get teeny tiny little caterpillars come out of them. Eat your arugula. <laughs> the caterpillars will eat your arugula, yes. But she's in, uh, Louise is in Broward County, and my guess is arugula season is over with down there in Broward County because it's just getting too hot for any kind it's of very, It's a pretty anything. short season up here, isn't it? No, you can grow arugula all winter long here. You can grow oh, okay. um, as early as September, keep it going here till middle of March, maybe a little so bit it's a good. It's a good time down there to go ahead and sacrifice them to the butterflies or moths. So, yeah. Sure. Uh, Louise, if you want to let them hatch and then send us some more pictures to see, we can all see what came out of them. My guess is going to be a caterpillar. And I can't, I'm not too familiar with a specific caterpillar that really likes to feed on arugula. But if you let the caterpillar get a little bit bigger, I'm sure we can ID it and figure mm -hmm. out what kind of caterpillar it is. But yes, you're going to be the proud parent of a bunch of caterpillars <laughs> eating your arugula soon. So going back to that seminal pumpkin, yes, Corey says it keeps for a long time. That's true. The vine is sprawling and takes a while, but it grows through pest issues and makes a very good storage pumpkin. So it's going to get vines. The vines are going to grow all over the place. You're going to get these nice big kind of round winter squash. And if you store them in a cool, dry place or even really on your kitchen counter, um, they're going to last for quite some time. And Lori wants to know, when should Seminole pumpkins be started from seed now? Is it too late now? Not really. So I think starting them right now is a good time. I see a lot of people on Facebook, they try to grow them during the winter, they plant it during the fall. Seminole pumpkin likes warm season and it's well adapted to grow here in Florida in the heat of summer. So plant it now and grow it during the heat of summer. That's when it's gonna grow the best, do the best, you have the best chance of actually getting um, a bunch of Seminole pumpkins off of it. And Lori, we're all still learning. You can tell I don't know much about vegetables at all. Bill is my vegetable guy, so. I've never tried growing them. I've never tried eating them either. I'm going to have to look for calabasa and try it. I think it tastes very similar to an acorn squash, probably. Okay. Maybe a little bit different, but same shape and consistency. If we have any I recipe su suggestions from anybody, feel free to to join in here. <laughs> um, I saw a picture yesterday that Frank from Pasco County, you know, who has my same job there, uh -huh. um, took a picture of some pollinators on some dill um, on there, I guess their demonstration garden. But guess what the one extra little pollinator he found on there was? 
Was it a nice big caterpillar eating it? No, no, no. Oh. It was something um, that is a little timely. Maybe a couple weeks early, but it's they're going to start appearing soon. <laughs> June bugs? It was a love bug. Oh, oh okay. Yeah. <laughs> and they are pollinators. As annoying as they may be, they also, you know, not on, not intentionally, but probably incident. They're incidental pollinators. Yeah, they're not major pollinators. Right, but right. But anything that moves from plant to plant, very, very little. But they do visit flowers. Sure. You know what I've seen them absolutely go crazy for, and I almost hate to say it because then people won't want that plant. Simpson stopper. They're all over that. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> And maybe, or put it in to keep them off your car. <laughs> you know, they'd rather be on the Simpson stopper. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It could be an, an attractant uh, to yeah, keep them away yeah. from other things. And Louise mm -hmm. says, yes, that arugula has bolted. Yeah, that it's that time of year, definitely in South Florida and even here in Central Florida. And she'll send more pictures with Great. whatever hatches out of those eggs. A lot of times, even when people bring eggs, got babies coming. <laughs> when somebody brings eggs here to the office, we'll just keep them in a container, and within a couple of days to a week or so, something's going to come out of them, and that's a lot easier to ID than the actual egg. IDing insect eggs is definitely an art that can be kind of tricky. Oh, and Nicole yeah. is here from Texas. Good morning, Nicole. Is it <laughs> What part of Texas? South Texas or North Texas? And is it cold there? Because it's not cold here. It was 55 this morning. <laughs> I think I was 59. Uh, yeah. Well, see, I'm a little colder up here. Yeah. Up here well, in these Royal Highlands. And I, uh, usually by the time I drive from my house up here, um, oh, down to 50. Now you got to consider 50 is a lot more urban. <laughs> it's it, it always um raises three to four degrees just in that short distance too. yeah yeah of course that may change with all the houses that are being built <laughs> around me too yeah i don't even know where all these different subdivisions are being planned for or where they're going lots of places so, yeah, yeah we, have, we have intentional subdivisions and then we have the royal highlands which was platted out you know in the 70s and it's huge. It is absolutely huge. It is like, I'd say from 50 up to the Citrus County line in different patches. Yeah. And um, it didn't take off like they thought it would. Spring Hill took off instead. But in, you know, like yearly groupings, <laughs> we have huge booms out here. And we're in, we're in the middle of one right now. There are... Uh, two new houses on my street in the past year, and two are being built as we speak. So, Yeah, and that's going to continue for a bit longer, that's mm -hmm. for sure. Oh, yes. And that gives us a lot of opportunities to teach new residents how to properly care for their lawn and irrigation and yes. what to do with a palm tree and everything else. And, you know, it really opens your eyes. And we talked about that in the first class we had in our rotted, recycled and resurrected class that Bernie Bathauer, the master gardener, taught about soil science. And he basically said, whatever soil was here when Ponce de Leon came, it's gone. <laughs> you know, that original soil, very few places is that left. We have either farmed it out or you know, urbanized it out. And you can watch that. Well, first of all, here in the Royal Highlands, at one time, there was all the cedar and pines. And then the town of Centralia, which the name, the road was named after, was a boom town, a boom lumber town. It was exactly like the Lorax. <laughs> they just took everything down, you know, and then like, oh, there's nothing left here. And they left in the early 1900s. So, now we have kind of, you know, this, it was, it's kind of naturally sand hills anyway, 
but all these little turkey oaks and stuff, native, but opportunistic weeds that popped up in place of what was supposed to be here, the pines and the cedars and all that. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so that affected the ground. But then with all this building that's going on, and I watch it, I was talking with um, Don Velser from planning, our planning department yesterday. You know, these are half acre lots and they used to just clear a quarter acre of it, leave the back the way it was. Some companies are still doing that. Other ones are just clearing it all. And I mean, within an hour, you can go from this hundred year old woods that grew up since Centralia to nothing, yep. nothing. It's gone, that whole thing. And then they bring in fill dirt, which where do they get the fill dirt from? From somewhere where they dug a DRA or something. You know, it's not topsoil at all. It's nutrition less. <laughs> And they they build it up, you know, and put your house on that. And that's where what they try to build your sod and your landscaping on. And that is the sad reality of what we're dealing with. Yes. So that's don't where we feel start bad problem. if you have if you struggle because, you know, that foundation you're working on is not helping you much. So. So that's why I'm scrolling our uh, website down at the very bottom www.hernandoextensionalloneword.com. If you go there, you're going to see a full listing of all of our upcoming classes. And I know in June, we have a lot of classes geared towards water conservation. We do. Water conservation is always an important topic. Uh -huh. And like I said, let me check that date. It's May 25th. We have a class on growing calabasa. And lots of other classes coming mm -hmm. up. Yep, June. So. Um, Bill wanted to make June Water Conservation Month. Then we found out, I guess, nationally, April is mm -hmm. Water Conservation Month. That's fine with me because I work for water conservation. So for me, every month is Water Conservation <laughs> Month. Exactly. And it's kind of like Earth Day. You know, people ask if we're doing anything special or whatever. Everything we do, we ever, we're oh. always Earth Day. <laughs> so... You know, we, we don't have a special thing set aside for it because that, that's us. That's what we do. Yeah, we celebrate it all the time, not just once a year and then forget about it. And right, right. A question about carrots in Broward County. Yes, Gail says, I'm growing carrots in Broward County. How do I know when they're ready to harvest? Well, they need to be harvested soon because that's another cool season vegetable crop. And... Um, in Broward County, cool season is over and done with, I think, as of yesterday. So <laughs> with the carrot, the way you could tell is where the, the carrot greenery is coming out of the ground. If you just feel around the base of the greenery, you'll feel the top of the root. And when the carrot, the top of it is an appropriate size, it gives you an idea if you have a worthwhile carrot underneath or not. Now, you can never tell for sure until you pull it up. And you're going to pull up and you're going to have a really long fat carrot or you're going to have a fat carrot that's like two inches long and you never know until you dig it up and after you pull it up you really can't put it back in but you're you need to be thinking about harvesting the carrots one way or the other baby carrots full-grown carrots whatever it might be pretty soon because as it gets hot they don't do really well and if you have nematodes in your soil the warmer it gets, the more they're going to damage everything, and they will damage carrots. Mm -hmm. So, now if you were up north, though, you could leave them in the ground all winter long. Yeah, <laughs> I know you. this. I know this because my daughter just found some that you know. I get they were in the in in there all winter long, and she just like, oh, what's this? And then she found a whole bunch of nice carrots there. So, and here in Central Florida. You can plant them in September or October and just grow them all winter long. Right. But by the middle of March, winter cool season is pretty much wrapping up. So by March 15th, you need to be seriously thinking about pulling the lettuce, the kale, the carrots, the broccoli, the cauliflower, everything. Mm -hmm. You don't have to pull it up by that day, but you do need to have a plan for pulling it up really soon. But that's the time of year where all that stuff has to come out and go. 
to make room for tomatoes, peppers, beans, okra, eventually, and everything else. So. What, when should they do tomatoes? When should they have started tomatoes, I should say? Spring tomatoes, if you want to grow your own from seed, I would plant my tomato seeds the week between Christmas and New Year's. And that's good and early so that by March 15th or whenever you're going to put them in the ground, you have nice big transplants to put in, big healthy transplants. So if you want to start tomatoes from seed, it's too late now. If you want to go to a nursery and buy already growing tomatoes, you can do that. You'll need to go in the ground really soon, really soon. And they have a really limited variety of different supply of different varieties there. If you look through some quality uh, tomato um, seed catalogs, oh my gosh, there's hundreds, hundreds and hundreds of varieties of tomatoes you can try. And they're either going to do great and you're going to keep growing them or they're going to do terrible and you're never going to grow them again. And you don't know which until you give it a shot. So that's what I do. I just try different tomatoes and then remember the ones that did really well. That's how I ended up with my favorites. And there's other ones I'm just not going to try again. My neighbor's got a hydroponic tomato garden going on. It's it's a rather sophisticated operation, but he, it looks beautiful. I'll send you maybe next week. We can show pictures of it. He's got sure. some peppers too. And then as he cleans out the tomatoes, you know, as it gets the suckers and stuff on the vines, he uses some of those to clone some more, you know, to keep mm -hmm. keep it going. But even in the heat of the summer, even with a hydroponic operation, because I'm sure he doesn't cool the water like you mentioned, um, he's done. But it does last it, it lasts maybe through June. But, you know, July and August, yeah. they take a break. Yeah, to be to be safe you should plan on and kind of aim for June 15th to be done with those things. Mm -hmm. You could stretch them a little bit longer. It depends on the weather, depends on the health of the plants, whether you're growing it hydroponically, depends on your soil, depends on a lot of things. I can tell you this neighborhood has been eating a lot of tomatoes. <laughs> yeah, but I can I pretty certainly tell you that Tomatoes and cucumbers, you're not going to grow in July and August here. No. You are going to put a ton of water and fertilizer and fungicides and insecticides on it, and you're probably still not going to get much for your dinner plate. So it's better to work with the seasons and not constantly fight them. Now, if you're a little bit more advanced, sure. I mean, by all means, experiment and play with hydroponics and shade houses and uh, greenhouses in the winter to keep things warmer. Um, but that's, you know, once you get past the basics, you become a little bit more advanced. You can play with that. Mm -hmm. So Corey, I think had a comment about out there in the beautiful Royal Highlands. He said much of his area was pine and oak savanna, lumber, turpentine, Free range cattle. Do you have any free range cattle in your neighborhood anymore? Like? Um, not anymore. Okay. <laughs> they look but down yeah. on that now. <laughs> if if you go out to the countryside, it's still native soil out there. So if you buy ten acres way out in the country and you put a house on it, and they just and the the land is high enough where you don't have to bring in fill dirt, right? And you build a house on it. Then you're you're working with your native soil, right? But generally, the developments they're not going to have that. Yeah, and that yeah, you're the, I know exactly where you can see, physically see where our area is moving to Oak Hammock. It is literally like um, east of the Parkway, and that's been happening for years. You can literally see the difference. Um, where it changes by the time you get to citrus way you're full on in a oak hammock but you know um halfway down centralia it changes to the sand pine and i don't know whether that is a natural thing or a man-made thing or a combination of both there is a dry creek that runs through part of that and if you look at aerial pictures you can see the difference in greenery and not greenery like where areas are wet 
and areas aren't. So it, it's an interesting uh, area up here. Yeah, because it's normally fire that keeps those oaks out. Right. It keeps it just, you know, closer to pure mm -hmm. pine. But we don't like fires and residents and subdivisions really don't like fires nearby because no, no. they get ashes on their car. But well, fire is a no. natural part of Florida's ecosystems. And without it, it causes problems. You end up with right, bigger right. problems than a nice little control burn. So Marlene asks, what do you use to keep those pesky hornworms off of the tomato plants? And I found my first one on my tomatoes the other day, and it was a big one. You should have taken a picture. They're so I cool. should have. Well, yeah. I very quick, I just use this, and I pick them off and throw them over the fence into the neighbor's yard. <laughs> you always say that. Problem solved. Now, if you prefer not to use your fingers, because, you know, not everybody does, because when you, they're hard to pull off because they hold on really tight. And they start wiggling around. And Corey, Corey has a suggestion here. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. That works. Yes. Uh, no, he's talking about the controlled burns, not um, hornworm. Oh, control. okay. <laughs> yeah, Marlene's not too crazy about the 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 manual method. Yuck. Yes. A really good chemical control for uh, all kinds of caterpillars. So it works on hornworms and any other caterpillars because there's a couple other species of caterpillars that will eat your tomatoes. The other ones tend to eat a lot more holes in the actual tomatoes. Hornworms tend to just suck up all the leaves. But if you use a product called BT, that's Bacillus thuringiensis, and you can find that at the stores. It goes under the name of Caterpillar Killer or Dipel or Thuricide. That's a good organic control for caterpillars or spinosad. And you can find that as Captain Jack's Dead Bug Brew. And I saw a different manufacturer of spinosad. I think Monterey is making spinosad now. Both of those you can both of those you can buy from Amazon. You can go online, order it up, they'll ship it. You can order it direct from the company, have it here in a day or two. The nice UPS guy will bring it up to your front door. And both of those are safe to use, safe for you and the kiddos and the pets and everything else, and very, very effective with caterpillars. And Lily, Lori does want to burn down the hornworms. Okay, well. Lily, you were not correct. He was talking about the hornworms. Okay, well, that might, I mean, he's going to have roasted tomatoes. <laughs> And Deb says that uh, she used to get paid five cents for each tomato caterpillar. So cool. picking I think I would use tongs. off. I would use tongs and <laughs> pick them off with that. I'm more of a hands-on kind of guy. I yeah, just, you know, yeah. You're you're an entomologist. Color. You don't mind touching bugs. <laughs> <laughs> and Tammy's on here this morning. Tammy Katz, good morning. How are you doing? She says up in the Lake Lindsay area, they're still pretty much natural soil. Yeah, because that kind of, that, it's an old town that kind of grew more organically than some of our developments. And plus they have so much of the actual lake soil and the muck and everything there too. So yeah, beautiful, beautiful, beautiful area, beautiful oak hammock um, area. And Tab Tammy has... Goats and chickens and miniature cows and all kinds of stuff out there, too. But also, if you go to the Chinsigat Conservation Center, you will see also they kind of go in and out of different geographical regions. More hammock, more upland pine, you know, it kind of. And they are trying to bring that back to what it once was, you know, naturally as well. Yeah, we go back to the caterpillars. <laughs> oh, we're not done with the caterpillars yet. Well, somebody yeah, wants to know about the good cat. Squeeze for good luck, I guess. <laughs> the Facebook user wants to know if you're going to kill the caterpillars they want as well as those others. We're yeah. getting to that, but Tammy says that she likes hands on too. So, <laughs> but yes, those controls kill caterpillars. 
they kill tomato hornworms just as quick as they kill monarch butterfly caterpillars. So you have to be very careful where you spray it. So if you spray it on your tomatoes, it'll kill the tomato hornworms. Just be careful not to spray it on the milkweed. And if you have or milkweed they're near it, yes. close by, be very careful that it's not breezy at all because you would be amazed at even in a little bit of a breeze, like less than five mile an hour breeze, if you're spraying something, it will travel many feet before that droplet hits Which the Which is why I think we're back to that picking thing that you, you know, that you originally suggested. And if you, I think the tongs are not a bad idea to pick them off, put them in a bucket of soapy water. That way you can be selective of removing the guys you don't want there. Mm -hmm. While protecting, you know, the um, caterpillars that you're not sure, you know, they may be the butterflies or the moths that you want. So, Sure. And don't forget, you you may have other plants in your yard. Um, passion vine, mm -hmm. which is a host plant for um, gulf fritillaries and zebra longwings. Um, what's the plant that gets the yellow flowers that's a host for sulfur butterflies? Cassia? Cassias, yeah. Mm -hmm. And lots of other plants that you may be you may have in your yard. Always figure out what the caterpillar is going to turn into before you set your mind to killing it. So staying okay. on that topic, <laughs> Deb remembers giving them a firm squeeze, and she said, just the tomato worms. So yeah. and they're I mean, if you took a picture of them and blew it up, it would look like a sci-fi movie. <laughs> and they're what? Like this big. They can be. And then oh, they've yeah, got they their did. horns, and they're pretty freaky looking. Mm -hmm. And see, Deb says okay. she sprays nothing. Her backyard is to Lily's liking. <laughs> I spray nothing as well. I mean, my yard is not... Um, you know, magazine worthy at all, but I, I would rather spray nothing and have it not look perfect, you know, and let, let yeah. life do its thing out there. And it depends. If I had a large number of small caterpillars on a vegetable crop, yeah, I go and mix up the spinosad and spray it. It's not that hard. It doesn't take that long. But if I'm out there checking my tomatoes in the afternoon when I get home from work and I see one hornworm, I'm just going to pick it off and throw it over the fence because that's the quickest and easiest way to deal with that. Maybe you should figure out how to cook them. They're probably very nutritional. Yeah. And that's another you know, maybe thing. Maybe made the, uh, the garlic and olive oil sauce yeah. for them. But that is another thing when I mentioned how nutritional. They are fat and juicy. I mean, they would probably make a wonderful meal for a baby bird. So, you know, you got to think – how all these things work together. Boy, you just keep going back to the cooking show idea, don't you? Oh, yeah. now, now we're <laughs> thinking up recipes for baby birds. <laughs> yes. I think their parents have that figured out. <laughs> <laughs> and Marlene says, as much as she dislikes picking them off, she'll probably use that method because she doesn't want to hurt the butterflies. I'll, I'll cut them off. <laughs> Whatever portion of the plant they're on, don't uh -huh. need that throw it away. <laughs> And it helps a lot if you check frequently and catch them when they're small as yeah. opposed to when they're really, really big. Um, they're going to do a lot more damage if you wait to pick them off when they're really big. <coughs> and, yeah, mechanical methods, especially if it's on a small scale, is the easiest way to go. I wonder if we could get any cases. Well, we're getting so unusual. You know, I think people are finally figuring out how to participate and uh, share comments with us here. So Corey said he saw a restaurant cook the tomato hornworms like green tomatoes. Okay, number one, we're not going to showcase that on our cooking channel. Um, <laughs> no, I'm just worried that I just had some fried green tomatoes at a restaurant recently. <laughs> yeah. What did I really eat? <laughs> so fried green hornworms, I guess. Yeah. Number two, I hope that wasn't a restaurant in Hernando County. No, no, it wasn't. Okay. Are you sure? 
I'm positive. I, <laughs> I know where I was. I don't know. Yeah, I kind of share uh, Deb's little emoji on that. I'm telling you, they're probably very nutritious <laughs> for somebody. <laughs> probably. Um, no, don't go trying it, though, because I don't know that they're not poisonous either. So. Yeah. The most commonly eaten insects tend to be large beetle grubs. Because. Hakuna Matata. They're large beetles and other insects are too hard or too crunchy, but beetle grubs are kind of the in between between too crunchy and not too crunchy. Sorry, we have a, a, a slew of different comments coming in here now. Yeah, so. Yes. Yep. And I think we have, a, we, we have a challenge I, for Lily. No, I will tell you, I have eaten grubs. I have done that. They were prepared. You know, they come in like little, like, you know, bags, like you can buy. Them. Oh, you can and buy I them. Have, I yeah. have eaten a bug. I have eaten a grub, but I, a tomato hornworm, I mean, it would have to be like really cut up in small pieces. <laughs> you will never really? guess who got me to eat the grub, Bill. <laughs> yeah, I've seen little boxes of yeah. beetle grubs and crickets. Yes. Also. It's a, it's a great kids' activity. You can get the kids to uh, try eating it and all go, ooh, and everything else. And they, the little boys, of course, will do it. And the little well, girls speaking of, yeah, speaking of little boys, that's what I said. You'll never guess who got me to do it. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I could have guessed. I, he's the one who showed them to me before. Yes. You can buy them in a little box, I think. Uh-huh, yep. So look, lovers with them. There you go. Them? Diana has an idea for our cooking channel, plant and grow it, cook and eat it. I like it. I like that too. I'm going to write that one down. So <laughs> It's a lot more involved than it sounds. Once we start doing a cooking show, we've got to have a Save Surf certified um, person involved and um, uh, different um, family and consumer science agents within the university and all of that. So... Can't be just Dr. Bill. Piece of cake. Piece of yeah. cake. And now we're eating lovers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, they just don't look good at all. <laughs> so, And I haven't even seen the birds eat them, so I don't think I'd want to try them. Yeah, and I've always been told that um, chickens won't eat them, except yeah. maybe when they're very, very small. Right. They don't make. Some people say they make okay fish bait. Other people say that even fish won't eat them once they get larger. So if those things aren't eating them, I, I sure wouldn't try. Yeah, she wants that cooking show. Yeah, yeah, you know, we're going to have to look at that. So we're going to have to give it a shot. Now we have so tomatoes. We actually have a question here. Corey says, any ideas for salad greens over the summer? Hoping someone has something to add to all the weird tropical spinaches. There are a number of plants that are called like Malabar spinach, New Zealand spinach, and technically it's not spinach. It is a green leafy plant where you can eat the leaves and the leaves are dark green. So people just call it spinach, but I'm pretty sure none of them are botanically like a variety of spinach. They're all edible. There's one that we sold at the nursery a year or two ago and it grew really well. It would turn into kind of a vine. And I was told that if you eat it raw, it's okay. But if you cook it, it gets really slimy. Mm -hmm. And there's a, a lot of people probably have a consistency issue with eating it. They grow great during yeah. the summer. I never tried it. So I really couldn't say from personal experience, whether it's good or okay or not that good. Um. Mm -hmm. We'll have a class on that. We'll definitely play in a class within the next month or so on some of the different um, tropical salad greens. Lily will help me come up with a name for it. That's what I do. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and Jennifer has tomatoes planted under the hoop house, which she covers with shade cloth for mid 80s plus temperatures. 
leaving about 12 to 18 inches open all the way around the bottom, which is great. That works really well. University of Florida has done a lot of research on that up in North Florida to figure out what varieties of tomatoes and peppers can grow under shade in the summer and how much shade to give them. Because shade cloth comes in different strengths. It could be 10% shade, 50%, 80%. And they've done all the work and you can look online and they have all the, everything that they found out from that. And they found that you can grow peppers really well all summer long under shade if you do it just right. Hmm. So she has society garlic and marigold plants planted between the tomatoes to keep the bugs at bay. She also put onion trimmings in with the tomatoes and she's had tomato plants producing for two years. That can happen. It's just really difficult for most gardeners to make that happen outdoors because so many of them move here from other states where, and Lily, how do you grow tomatoes in Pennsylvania? You should be starting soon, you know, or beginning of May or something like that. Yeah. Yeah, and you start in, in May, you put them out, they grow the best and you get all your tomatoes and peppers and even cucumbers during July and August. Yep. Then they wrap up in September whenever it cools off and then it's Halloween. Right. But here, if you just put them out in the garden, you're going to have a lot of problems. You can do it either through hydroponics, a greenhouse, a shade house, moving it or switching it from greenhouse in the winter to shade house in the summer. You can do it, but it's going to take a little bit of work and a little bit of research to get the right shade cloth to know when to put it up. You may have to get a fan to keep air movement inside going. Otherwise, it turns into like a furnace during the summer. So it can work. But it takes a whole lot of your attention. <laughs> yes. So see, Deb found a lover and she throws bugs over the fence. That's what I do. They, they I'm just not sure the that is, you know, something we should <laughs> <not> promote. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think we're kind of getting close to a wrap up time here, but yeah. Lee says, they, he grows microgreens in the summer in his kitchen. Sure. If you they don't do need that. a lot of light, yeah. And you can even grow lettuce mixtures in containers, in trays, outside or in a shaded spot in the heat of summer. But they're going to come up. And when they get an inch or two tall, that's when you have to pick them before they bolt. But you can do it. But you're is not going to get is there a class coming up ends on that? of lettuce or big romaine. You're going to get microgreens, basically. Some extension office, I think I shared it, <laughs> might be citrus, is having a class on that um, coming up, I believe. Uh, John Roberts in Orange County. Maybe that's who it is. Okay. Put in that. And he does okay. microgreens classes. And we have a video of an old hydroponics class on our Facebook page where he did a session on microgreens. Okay. What's the easiest way to tell somebody how to find out? Um, I'll share that. I'll share that on our Facebook page this afternoon. Okay. All right. So we have many peppers on the patio. Louise does in semi shade in felt pots which is like a kiddie pool. <laughs> she keeps a little bit of water in and it moistens the felt pots. Interesting. There are a lot of different ways that you can do it. A lot of things that you should experiment with. And when you're experimenting, you know, maybe it's going to work. Maybe you're going to fail miserably, but you're going to learn from it. Sure. And you're going to know what works and what doesn't work for the next time. What we don't want to see happen is people move here from other states and just make a timing mistake and get right, really right. frustrated and think, well, right. you just can't grow anything here and give up. You can grow plenty of stuff here. Yeah. So Jennifer says, maybe you should prepare a class for Northerners to teach them about gardening of Florida. I think every one of our classes is kind of has that underlying undertone to it. And I do have yeah newcomer's guide to Florida friendly landscaping. It's not vegetable gardening. Maybe that's something mm -hmm. you should concentrate on as well. 
but really it is just a matter of timing. That's, that's the only difference. There are some yep. things you can't grow here that you could grow there and vice versa, but mostly it's just different timing. You can grow most of the same vegetables just at different times. That's all. Exactly. And it's so much easier if you work with that timing because even then we can't predict the weather exactly. No. You don't know. I don't know if it's going to be a cold winter next year or a warm winter. Your garden can be looking beautiful and going like gangbusters. You get an early tropical storm. What was it just a few weeks ago? We got a lot of hail. Not here. But did you see about in the other counties they got three inches of hail on oh, the ground? Oh, wow. Yeah. And, and usually, at least here in Central Florida, we are two months ahead of what is happening, at least like in Pennsylvania. Our blackberries in the woods, I was just hiking in the woods, are getting ready to bloom. Mm -hmm. That's not going to happen up there till June, you know. Yeah. And we have um, lightning bugs flittering around right now. And some people think there are no lightning bugs in Florida. There are. They don't. I think they stay away from our lawns because um, it's not the right type of soil for them. Or if you have any chemicals on your lawn, they're not going to go there. You see them in the woods, in the undisturbed woods. And I think because the soil is, you know, they can grow, <laughs> you know, they can yeah. reproduce and everything underground there. But right now, like tonight, if you're in central Florida, if you're around a patch of woods, go out, you'll see them. But you know that's not happening up north till June-ish or so. Mm -hmm. So Just very different timing. And, yeah, we need to do the – I need to do the uh, basic vegetable gardening classes again this fall. That's a good time of year to do it. But, see, Lee says he moved here from New Jersey and couldn't grow tomatoes until he learned about the soil and zones for growing. So, right. And took a little practice, took a few years. Yeah. So it takes time, effort, reading, studying, experimenting, and you'll get there. You know, it, it can be done. But there's so many variables, and we can't predict the weather. Uh, we can't predict the hail or a warm winter or a cold winter or anything. So, and the weathermen can't predict it all that well. They do out a couple days, but, and like that. We're both says, trying to do that. Patience. And I think we should end on that. <laughs> yes. yes, we are going to end on that. On <laughs> patience. So. Patience, yes. So when the tomatoes die, when you got huge caterpillars all over and no leaves on your plants, just take a deep breath and... <sighs> Hey. Yes, <laughs> you will learn. And as I always tell the master gardeners, the only difference between a master and a novice is the master has failed many more times than the novice has tried. So that is. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And very quickly, there's my email. There's Lily's email. And we'll throw the ticker down there again for good measure so that you can keep on top of all of our upcoming classes because we always have a whole bunch of them scheduled and in the process of scheduling. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. so with that, guys, thank you so much. Everybody yeah. have a great talk today. Yeah. Yeah. I think people are starting to figure out pretty well how to make comments and <laughs> get going on here. So, so you're very welcome. And Diana, you are welcome also. Everybody have a fantastic day, and we will see you back here again next week, next Thursday at 10 a.m., and we'll see you then. Thanks. Same time, same place. Bye-bye. Exactly. <laughs>